I may need like 10 minutes to catch my breath after that, so y'all, y'all be patient with me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, choir, for that this morning. Well, as we are moving, we have Ash Wednesday this week, and then we're moving into the season of Lent. I wanted us to keep in mind what the end game of Lent is. We are moving towards Easter. And so today I wanted to talk to you about resurrection and what resurrection means for our lives today. Well, let me start off with this. We are a divided nation, aren't we? There's not much that we can all agree on anymore. We're divided on things like politics and religion and history and facts. I'm not sure how we got divided on normal, everyday facts, but that's how we've wound ourselves up here. Everyone watches their own form of news, their own channels. We're, we're all in this echo chamber where we hear what we want to hear. On the lighter side of things, we're also divided on things like, did you know that some people like to put pineapple on their pizza? How gross is that? If you're on team no pineapple on pizza, come talk to me after church. I would love to, to meet some others out there. Did you know that there are people who, who go to, the, uh, sh- uh, go to uh, the grocery store, they go to Walmart or Target, and they don't put away their shopping cart. They just leave it out there in the middle of the parking lot. Did you know that there are people who cheer for teams other than the University of Georgia Bulldogs? I've got some friends, some close friends who are Georgia Tech fans, and that must be so difficult for them, you know? There are people who have way too many items in the 10 items and underline at the grocery store. And then there are other people who count how many items somebody in front of them has in the 10 items and underline at the grocery store. Uh, You can imagine which person I am. (laughs) There are people who park in places that say no parking. There are people who insist on eating things like squash and cabbage and enjoying it. The only cabbage I want is one of those cabbage patch dolls. You remember those old things? That's that's the only cabbage I need. We disagree over so much in our world, don't we? So many differences, so many conflicts, so many arguments. But what is the one thing that unites all of us together? What is the one thing that brings all of us together? I know this is kind of morbid for a Sunday morning, but isn't it the reality of death? Sometimes we need to talk about this, right? Put it out in the open that death is going to happen to all of us. We can't hide from it. We can't run from it. We can't avoid it. And so the question that we all wonder today is what happens to us when we die? And that's where our differences come into play once again. Some people believe that we just cease to be when we die. That once life ends here, it's all over. They think that we need to live it up while we can here on this earth because this is all that we get. Other people believe that there's something more. But what? What does it look like? What will it be like? Well, just so everybody in the room, everybody watching online is clear... Christianity is very much in the camp of something happening after we die. And you'll hear different names for this in Scripture. Heaven, eternal life, new creation, resurrection. As Christians, we believe that this is not all that there is. So let's hear what Paul has to say to us in the Scriptures today. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. And thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. 
The first man was from the earth, a man of the dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Amen. Well, Paul seems to be very confident here of life after death. He doesn't believe that everything just ends when we die. He doesn't believe in nothingness. No, he believes in this thing called life in eternity. And he seems to believe that this life in eternity is going to be a very real and concrete thing. We're not going to be spirits kind of floating around up there, playing harps and having halos over our heads. No, Paul talks about these, these real, physical, resurrected bodies, real material bodies, similar to the ones that we have now, but also a little different. Think back to when Jesus was raised from the dead. He has a real body, his body. The marks of the nails are there. The mark of the spear is there. It's his body, but it's also a little different. He can enter into a locked room where the disciples are hiding in fear because of the Jewish leaders. He can ascend up into heaven, but he can also have breakfast with his disciples there on the beach. These new bodies will be different, but the same. New, but similar. Paul uses the image of a seed being planted in the ground. The seed is not the end result, is it? You don't get a harvest of more seeds after you plant a seed. That would be no good. That wouldn't help anybody at all. No, from that seed, you get something brand new. I remember I was serving in my first church, and it was a, a wonderful church out in the country, and my house was right in front of a field owned by one of the farmers in the church. And he loved to plant watermelons in that field, which was a good fit because I love to eat watermelons, and so it was a good marriage on that front. And Mr. Bob's watermelons were so good. They were so awesome. But those watermelons, they didn't start out that way, did they? No, they started out as what? Seed. It reminds me of an episode of the Andy Griffith Show when Goober grew out his beard and he thought of himself as a great philosopher. You can tell I'm growing out my beard. That's what I'm doing. I want to I wanna be known as a great philosopher. Well, Goober starts philosophizing around town and he's getting on everybody's nerves, driving everybody crazy. One day he's walking by the store and he sees a carton of apples out front, and he picks up one of these apples, and he looks at it and starts talking to it, and he says, Apple, once you was a seed. And he puts it back down. Well, he might be driving everybody crazy, but he's right, isn't he? Once that apple was a seed, once that watermelon was a seed, these current bodies we have are the seed, the kernel, Paul says. They're the beginning point, but they're not the ending point. God will have something so much better than these current ones. The difference will be like going from the seed to the actual fruit. Isn't that amazing to think about? Our new bodies won't get sick. No cancer. No disease. No hospitals and nursing homes. They won't get tired. There's no health insurance in heaven. These new bodies won't be marred by sin. We will simply be glorious new creations after Jesus Christ himself. Paul says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. This current body we have is perishable. It will not last forever. We are weak because of sin in the world, but these new bodies are not going to have that problem. Sin is going to be done away with. The heavens and the earth will be made new, and we will be new creations in the new world with our new bodies. Paul calls this body a spiritual body. Now, that's kind of a tricky image there. We can start to think that we'll just be spirits floating around somewhere, but most scholars think what Paul is saying here is that our new bodies will be animated by the Holy Spirit. 
Our new bodies will be given life by the Holy Spirit. These will be spiritual bodies, and they will be very real and physical and holy spiritual. Now, while all of this sounds well and good, what does any of it mean for us here today? I mean, this is something that's out there in the future, right? So we don't have to worry about anything right now, do we? Well, the first thing that I want us to know today is that while the Scriptures promise eternity, we don't actually know when that's going to be for us. We can't assume that eternity is going to be a long way away, and so we just live it up while we're here on earth. No, these current bodies are mortal. These current bodies can give out at any time. These current bodies can get sick. Something can go wrong, and that can happen at any point. So what we need to do today is to make sure our lives are on the right track. And that begins by saying yes to Jesus, acknowledging our sin, making him the Lord of our lives, and then we follow him. We live for him with all that we have. We don't do that to to get some reward after we die. We do it because we love him and because he loves us so much. We join ourselves with Christ and we can start to be conformed to his image. Paul talks about here the, the image of the earthly man, the man of dust, which is the image of Adam. And with the image of Adam comes the reality of sin in our lives. And we've got that part down, don't we? We've got the sinful part down pat. But now we have the image to be remade into the image of the heavenly man, Christ Jesus. And that can start now. And then one day in the future, we will be fully transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And what a glorious day that will be. So let's start practicing here and now for it. You know, the New Testament also teaches that Jesus can return to the world at any point. And then the world, as we know it, will be over. The new creation will come. And then that could happen any day. Today, tomorrow, next week, next year. We can't just assume that we have all the time in the world. Because we don't. The only guaranteed time that we have is the present moment. So let's not waste it. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is the day when Jesus returns. No one knows when a thief is going to break into their house, do we? They don't give us an advance notice and say, Hey, Jack, by the way, I'm going to break into your house at 10 o'clock tomorrow. No, it can happen at any time. Well, in that same way, that's how Jesus is going to return. Therefore, we have to be prepared now. We want to get our lives on track now. The second thing that should be on our hearts and minds today is that we should want everyone else to experience eternity as well. We don't just want it for ourselves. We don't just want to keep it to us. We want everybody that we know and love to be a part of it. We want those that we don't even know to be a part of it. I tell you, I would even love for those who have wronged me and hurt me to be a part of eternity. Maybe off in another room where I never see them and never encounter them, but I want them to be there. So what do we have to do to make sure that that others are in eternity with us? We have to evangelize, right? And I know it's kind of a dirty word in our day and time. We live in a world that says, hey, you believe whatever you want to believe, I'll believe what I believe, and just, you know, let us be. But as Christians, we have this thing called called good news in our possession. We have this Savior that we want others to meet. And in order for that to happen, we actually have to talk to others about Jesus. That's what evangelism means. It's not a dirty word. We talk to somebody else about Christ. We tell them what he means to us. We tell others what he's done in our lives. Now, we don't shove Jesus down the throat of other people, but we do actually have to speak up, don't we? You see, if if we never talk about Jesus, how will those around us know who he is and what he means to us? If we keep Jesus Christ to ourselves, they'll never know why we're living our lives the way we are. And that would be a failure. For them and for us. They'll be off searching for life in all of the wrong places. I remember 
seeing a story in the news from Providence, Rhode Island, where a couple of boneheaded attendees at a local wedding reception borrowed a flare gun and some flares and set out on the water on a small boat. And they got out there during the wedding reception and they started firing off their flares where they thought they could be seen by the other people at the wedding reception. They thought this would be fun. I don't know why this was their big idea for the night. They had probably been drinking a little bit, I would imagine, is what was going on. Well, other people who were not at the wedding reception, they saw these flares coming up in the sky. And so they alerted the Coast Guard and thought somebody needed help out on the water. And it became this whole big ordeal. The Coast Guard deployed their boats and their helicopters looking for the people who needed help. The story said that they, they spent almost $100,000 searching for these people who were in need of rescuing when there was no one in need of rescuing. Well, the idiots both had to pay $5,000 in their fines, and I think that's a little lenient, don't you? I think they could have gone a little higher than $5,000, but uh, it got me thinking about evangelism. Did you know that there are people all around us who are firing flares up in the air every day, saying, over here, real life is over here. This is what true life is all about. Come and follow after me, and none of it is the real thing. None of it is true life. We know the real thing, don't we? Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. He is real life. He is true life. He is the way to eternity and new creation. We are those who evangelize. We are those who share the good news. And so I would challenge you this week to talk to someone you know and love about Jesus. I don't want you to go up and approach a stranger that you don't know. That's always pretty intimidating. Why don't you stick to somebody that you do know, maybe somebody in your household, your spouse, your kids. Maybe it's a friend or a neighbor or a coworker. And you say, hey, you know, I don't really talk a lot about this, but I just wanted to tell you that I'm a Christian. I love Jesus, and I love what he's done in my life. And here's some of what he means to me. That's doable isn't it? We share because we want them to be saved too. We share because we want them in eternity too. We share because we want them to have transformed bodies, resurrected bodies too. Evangelism. Finally, resurrection means that we can live with eternal hope here and now. It means that we don't always have to fight to stay young and vibrant in this life. Uh, I saw a story recently of a supermodel who went in to have some cosmetic work done, and it all went wrong. And it left her scarred in the exact opposite of what she went in for. But we don't have to fight so hard to keep these bodies young. We don't have to have all the, all the surgeries and take all the supplements and use all the, the creams and the cleansers and the potions or whatever we come up with. We know these bodies aren't going to last forever. It's okay. We can accept getting older because as Christians, we have something else that we're looking forward to, don't we? We have eternal hope. We have the hope of resurrection from the dead. Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. What he means by that is that These bodies, as currently constituted, cannot enter eternity. But the good news of the gospel is that these bodies are not all there is to the story. There is something more, something far better than we can even understand. So what's the deal with resurrection? The New Testament speaks of Jesus as the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn. That means he won't be the last, right? As he was raised to new life, so will we who follow him. As we give our lives to Jesus, as we love him and live for him, we have the hope of eternity. We have the hope of resurrection. We have the hope of transformed bodies in the new creation where we get to spend eternity with God. These current bodies will go into the ground. Something far greater will arise. 
We may still live in a world where we can't agree on much. But maybe at least everybody in this room, maybe we can all agree that eternity sounds like a really good thing. Maybe we can all agree that transformed bodies sounds like a really good thing. True relationship with God forever sounds like a really good thing. May we live for Jesus now so that we can live with Jesus then. Because if Paul is right, and I believe that he is, it's going to be astonishing. And I want to be a part of that. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the the gift of eternal life. We thank you for the hope of resurrection. We know we don't deserve such a thing, but it's all out of your mercy and your grace. God, we want to live for Jesus now. We want to follow after Jesus now. We want to be faithful disciples now. And then we want to live with you forever. We want to spend eternity with you. We want to spend eternity with everybody that we love and care about. So, Lord, help us to share the good news this week. Help us to live with eternal hope and also to share eternal hope with others so that they may know the good news, too, so that they may be transformed as we have been. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.